Hi folks, this talk is Code That Can't Fail, backed by Cassandra. My name is Lauren and I'm a DevRel engineer at Temporal. I'm going to introduce a concept called durable execution, and then I'll explain how we designed a system that provides durable execution. Finally, I'll share a few learnings we've had working with Cassandra at scale. Part one, durable execution. So what even is code that can't fail? Now, I don't mean expected errors like your code charges a card and gets a card expired error. What I mean is that you can write a function that will not fail to complete execute. It is guaranteed to finish running. Now, you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Of course my functions finish executing. That's how code works. But there are a number of different cases in which your code might uh, fail to complete. The process could crash. Maybe you divide it by zero. The process could be killed by the OS. Maybe it's out of memory. The machine could lose power. You could deploy a new version of your code. And while usually you'd set up a graceful shutdown for the old processes, uh, they may be doing something longer than the grace period, like a sleep statement for one hour, and that would get interrupted by the force shutdown after, say, a five minute grace, per grace period. The final reason is transient failures, like temporarily unable to reach a downstream service. Now, of course, you could catch and handle this type of error and retry with exponential back off, but A, that can be a lot of code to write everywhere you hit the network, and B, if the retries go on for long enough, you'll go past the redeployment graceful shutdown window, get killed, and lose the state of whatever you were trying to do. Durable execution takes care of all of these failures. It runs your code in a way that persists each step taken, so that in the event of a failure, it can read execution history from disk and continue executing your function from the same place with a call stack and local variables intact. So this is great for any application that needs a high level of reliability and correctness. Applications uh, that already are or, or should be manually checkpointing progress, saving state to the database after each step to ensure the ability to recover from execution getting inter interrupted. Uh, those applications can throw away their manual database updates and state machine code and instead write a durable function with automatically persisted steps and recovery. But maybe you're like, my application doesn't need that level of reliability. I never have long sleeps. I already have retry code, and it's okay if there's a restart on rare occasion and retry gets interrupted and lost. It's a bug, and we'll either lose data or end up with inconsistent data. Uh, but if it happens once in a blue moon, that's fine. My answer to that is if you have a decent sized load, uh, even application with a normal amount of complexity in terms of downstream services and third party APIs, uh, you're going to have a significant amount of dropped work. So you're going to need to persist retry information and timers and have a pool of workers that pick up dropped work. And you need to do that for every service boundary and every important third-party API. That's a lot of code to write, debug, and maintain. That's why people uh, do choreography using a message bus to coordinate between services or orchestration where there's a central coordinator um, uh, deciding which services to call. Choreography gets really complex to reason about and debug when things go wrong. Uh, in the microservices patterns book, uh, Chris Richardson recommends using orchestration for all but the simplest of use cases. And you can think of durable execution as like a developer-friendly version of orchestration. So if your work is important and you don't want to drop it, you can either write and maintain a lot of code to try make sure it's not dropped, or you can use durable execution and code at a higher level of abstraction where you don't have to care about crashes and redeployments and retries and even about saving state. Not only is durable execution taking care of things it used to have to do manually, but it opens up new ways of programming. You can sleep for 30 days, and not only will the function reliably go to the next line of code after 30 days passes, but you also won't be taking up resources during those 30 days because the system will know the function isn't in use, kill it in order to free up resources for active functions, and when 30 days comes around, recover the function to the correct state. So you could easily code a subscription, uh, charging the customer every 30 days in a loop. Since these functions are potentially long running, you may want to query them for their state or send them instructions. So durable functions provide mechanisms to receive and respond to RPCs. For instance, on Amazon, there's a 30 minute cancellation window on each order. If that was implemented with a durable function, you would start the function at order time. The function would reserve the item uh, from the inventory service, sleep for 30 minutes. And if it received an RPC that said cancel before then, it would free up that inventory send a cancellation successful email and return. Durable functions can also be indefinitely long running. For example, you could have a customer function that runs forever and implements your customer loyalty program. Whenever the customer makes a purchase, you send that customer's 
durable function in RPC with the purchase info, and the function adds to that customer's loyalty points um, and decides whether to send them an email or maybe with a coupon or, or an encouragement to hit the next loyalty level. Finally, if you have a function that can last forever and can't fail, and that can respond to RPCs, you no longer need a database. In the last example, when the customer logs into their account to view their loyalty points, we don't need to look it up in a database. Instead, we can send a get points RPC to the function and it responds with the number of points from the local variable that it's stored in. To more concretely show what I'm talking about, um, let's go through a couple of examples. First, here's the subscription implementation uh, uh, is a durable function. It takes a user object and the amount to charge. It starts out with cancel false, uh, sets up a handler for an RPC called cancel which sets cancel to true and sends a confirmation email. Then it loops while not canceled, charge the user, and sleep for 30 days. So the function will wake up when the sleep timer goes off or when it receives a cancel RPC and otherwise won't take up resources. Also, both the send email and the charge functions will automatically retry on failures, like our email service is down or we can't reach right. Now, here is the loyalty program example. When a user signs up, you call the function with the user object, and they start with zero points. Whenever the user makes a purchase, we send a notify purchase RPC to the function, and it adds to the points total and decides whether to send the user a coupon. Whenever the user views their profile, we send a get points RPC to the function, which returns the points total. Finally, the function needs to not return uh, so that it stays running, so we wait uh, for a promise that never resolves. So that's the whole, whole loyalty program. It's pretty basic, but it's reliable, scalable, and durable. We don't need to save the points total to a database. We can trust that the local variable will always be there and be accurate. And that is durable execution. It's running functions in a way that is process independent. They survive process death, and long running functions are intentionally run by different processes over time. It automatically retries any functions that might have transient failures. You can sleep for arbitrary periods of time. You can send messages to the function and receive responses. Your functions can last indefinitely long. And you can treat your local variables as durable state. Here are the systems that support durable execution. At the bottom is Temporal, where I work. Our co-founders, Maxime and Summer, launched AWS Simple Workflow Service in 2012. And Summer went on to Microsoft and built Azure Durable Task Framework which became so popular that it was adopted by uh, Azure Durable Functions. Uh, Summer and Maxim uh, got back together at Uber, where they created Cadence in 2016, which is used by Uber Engineering for hundreds of use cases and was adopted by a number of other companies as well. They left Uber in 2019 to recruit Temporal, uh, which is a fork of Cadence that now has a team of 130 people working on it, including me. And here are some companies that use Temporal, including Stripe, Netflix, Snap, Box, Coinbase, and Datadog. Now that we have a better sense of what durable execution is, let's get into how we implement the system that provides durable execution. At a high level, there are three parts of the system. There's a client library that you use to start durable functions, or stop them, or send RPCs to them. It talks via gRPC to the server, which saves the progress of the function to the database. There's a worker, which uses uh, one of our language runtimes. We support Go, Java, Python, Node, PHP, and are working on .NET and Ruby. Uh, and has your code. The workers are polling the server for tasks, and when they get a task, they run your code, like calling a durable function or calling a function's RPC handler. Then the worker sends the server the results of running the code. Let's look at a couple concrete examples. We can start the subscription function we saw earlier by using the client to send the server a start function message. The server saves the request in the database and replies that it has received and accepted the request. The server creates a start function task for the worker. The worker pulls and receives the task and calls the function, since the worker is the uh, process that had the code. The function initializes a variable, uh, sets up an RPC handler, enters the loop, and then hits the line await charge. That's the result of executing the start function task. Uh, and at this point, the worker sends that result to the server. The worker is saying, the next step of running the subscription function is calling this charge function. Now let's look inside the server to see how it handles receiving the next step. Inside the server component are a few different services and a couple data stores. The front end service receives the next step from the worker along with the ID of um, 
this instance of the subscription function. Each instance uh, has an ID that is unique among uh, all running functions, and it's provided by the client at start time. We hash the ID to determine which host uh, the function belongs to. In this case, uh, function ID 5 belongs to host B, so that's where the front-end service forwards the request to. Each host has a database partition or shard. We support MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, and Cassandra, uh, but it's a very write-heavy load since each step of each function you run is written to the database, uh, and you can scale, uh, scale that write load much higher with Cassandra, so we use Cassandra for our cloud service. Our cloud service is a hosted version of the server, uh, but it's open source and many companies uh, host themselves. Uh, the cloud pitch is that you'll save time and thus money, as well as peace of mind if, you, if the experts host and maintain it for you. Now let's zoom in on just host B and partition B. When host B gets the message to call charge, it needs to do three things. Update the state of the function, add a charge task to the queue so that a worker can pick it up and execute it, and add a timeout. There are many types of timeouts that might be set. In this case, it might be the maximum length of time the charge function can be tried and retried before we consider it permanently failed, at which point that line of code in the subscription function will throw an error. It's important that uh, all three of these things are done together atomically, because otherwise you'll run into various sorts of race conditions and inconsistencies, inconsistencies. Like if you update state first and then fail to add the task to the queue, then the system will think there's a task that's not there. Or if you add to the queue first and then you do the update, but the update is slow, uh, the task might be completed before the update goes through. So we use a single partition logged batch statement uh, to get atomicity and isolation. An issue with having the tasks on each partition is query, form, query performance. Uh, with Cassandra, I, I think of your schema design following your query patterns versus relational, where you can generally with, with, start with a schema and, and query arbitrarily. So when we're thinking uh, of the query, give me the next task on QFU, QFU, uh, we would need to check all of the partitions because they're partitioned by function ID, not by queue name, and that's not scalable. So we have a separate table called tasks on the right, partitioned by queue name, and a separate service for responding to queue queries. queries. Uh, and we have a service uh, that moves tasks from the functions table partitions on the left to the queue table on the right, and it takes care of retrying and deduping. This is the transactional outbox pattern, and the queues on the left are also called transfer queues. Also, a single queue can have a load higher than a single host can handle. So in reality, we shard the hosts on the right uh, further beyond just queue name. So now when a worker asks the front end service for new work on task queue foo, it will get forwarded to host one, which will take the charge task from partition one. When the worker receives the charge task, it will call the charge function. If the function fails, the worker will report that back to the server. If it's something uh, transient, like a network error, the server will schedule the same task for a future time. If it's something permanent, like a car expired error, the server will record that result and put a task on the queue to activate the subscri subscription function, which will throw from the charge line. If the charge succeeds, the server will record the result and activate the subscri subscription function, passing the result. That's as far as I'll go into Temporal's architecture. Uh, for the next section, I talked to one of our engineers that has the most experience with Cassandra to get a few quick things we've learned from using Cassandra uh, a lot under high load. The first thing is uh, we have a lot of queues, and as an old Datastax blog post says, queues are an anti-pattern in Cassandra. Uh, a simple example is if we have a tasks table with queue name and queued at time UUID uh, and task info. Uh, if we insert 10,000 tasks onto QFU and QFU, and then uh, DQ or delete all but the most recent, then there will be 9,999 tombstones, uh, which by default will stick around for their 10-day garbage collection grace period. Uh, if we do the query on the right, select a single task from QFU, then Cassandra will have to go through all of those tombstones before finding the most recently inserted task, and that can take, in a blog post example, 300 milliseconds. The solution is to avoid most or all of these tombstones by adding uh, to the where clause to tell Cassandra where to start scanning. Um, and here's a link to the blog post, uh, an example uh, of us doing this in our code. Here are some miscellaneous recommendations we had. Uh, generally, Cassandra is a great fit for write-heavy workloads, um, and especially nice for append-only tables. Uh, try to avoid lightweight transactions beyond the 4x latency of 
Paxos four phase commit. There's also the potential for contention during two of the phases. Uh, we wound up implementing a client side in memory lock to avoid sending concurrent lightweight transactions. And there's also the need, uh, if you use lightweight transactions to insert rows, to only use lightweight transactions for reading and writing on that table. Uh, try to avoid secondary indexes or materialized views. Uh, use Elasticsearch for searching uh, and avoid large partitions. To recap, we learned what durable execution is, how it's programming at a higher level of abstraction, where a number of different distributed systems concerns are, are taken care of automatically for you. We also look at how part of the internals uh, of how that's in implemented and shared a few suggestions from our time with Cassandra. I'll end with something we like to say, which is distributed systems should hold you up, not hold you back. Uh, we've made software to support you in having a better development experience. If you'd like to learn more, our website is temporal.io. I'm Lauren DSR on Twitter and happy to answer any questions you have. And these slides are available at t.mp slash can't fail forward. Thanks for your time.